Hi, this is Ryan Bloom. On today's episode of the Fireside Chat, we'll be talking to Michael McGowan, landscape architect and a member of the KAA Design Group based out of Los Angeles, California. We're going to hear about Michael's childhood in Maryland, growing up building bike paths in the forest near his home, and how his childhood experiences really informed what he wanted to do with his career and what led him into landscape architecture. We'll hear about trends, what he is seeing from clients, and this new normal of using outdoor space to really create outdoor rooms that are deeply meaningful to him and his clients. Enjoy. Michael. Ryan, how are you? I am well, my friend. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Nice to see you. Yes, nice to see you again. Thank you. So I'm in Montreal, and you're in California, and you're wearing what looks like a pretty thick vest or jacket and a hat, so you're going to have to explain how this is, how this is going down. Yeah, and um, I'm out in my garage um, in order to get better um, audio and quiet. Cool. Um, um, and but it's chilly here this morning. Okay. Uh, I, I, my my skin and blood is not as hardened as it used to be when I lived on the East Coast. So <laughs> every little every little dip in in the temperature is probably only sixty five degrees outside. But I hear you. But I turn into, you know, I turn into a wimp when it comes. Yeah, to it's not a wimp. You know, it, it, it's really. I mean, I, I, I've lived. You know, from Montreal, but having lived. You know, I've lived in Africa. I've lived in the U.S. and in Carmel, California. Uh, I've lived in Beaufort, South Carolina. I've lived in the Cayman Islands, and the body adapts really quickly. And then things yeah. feel very foreign when yeah. uh, after I mean, the body is adapted. Yeah. So thanks for, uh, thanks for making the time. I appreciate, uh, appreciate you investing the time to, uh, to speak to me. Um, My pleasure. If, if it's okay, I'd love to kind of just first, uh, you know, I think it's so important, you know, especially in, in California with what you've dealt with in terms of the, the fires and the impact of, of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously the impact of, of COVID and I've just been, watching the numbers and know that California is, you know, having a, a real tough time along with other states like, like Texas and, and Arizona and Florida, of course. And yeah. so just first want to ask, how are you, your family, your, your, your colleagues at work amidst all of these, all of these factors? Um, yeah. Thank, thank you for asking. Um, things um, are, are, are good. I think on all, all fronts, um, you know, Every now and then, a uh, coworker will, um, you know, will identify that you know they, you know, they know somebody who, you know, either has tested positive or or was you know in close contact with, with somebody who who tested pos- positive, and um, you know, and that kind of sends a, you know, a, a ripple of contact tracing through the office, um, you know, out of a an abundance of caution a lot of times, but also just to, you know, maintain the safety of, of everybody that, you know, we come into contact with me yep. by, by the nature of our industry. You know, we tend to, um, we have the potential to be mass spreaders because we're, you know, we're constantly going around to different job sites where we're interacting with different groups that, you know, then can, um, so, uh, so you know, so we just try to be very cautious and um, and aware um, of uh, you know of 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 you know what our role would be, you know, in keeping all of those job sites and our sure. office members safe. So sure. um, the fires have have have, um, have died down to the point where um, you know we're not having you know constant gray gray wow. days from from smoke cover um thank, thank you know, goodness I, for yeah. that yeah. yeah well on to uh mm. on to more positive subjects if you will and, yeah. and what yeah. i really yeah. wanted to talk to you about 
Uh, before we sort of jump in, I, I'd like to or ask you for just a little bit of your story. I, I know that you know you 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 sort of grew up, as you said, on the on the East Coast in Maryland, and your education or your your your, your university education was you know in geography and 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 and, uh, and regional planning, and then you really shifted into landscape architecture. Tell me, if you can, in, in a few minutes, a little bit about your story, mm-hmm. how you got to where you are today with the uh, the KAA design group just a little bit about you and and your story and your passion yeah uh, absolutely uh, yeah, yeah like you said um, uh, you know I um, you know going back before undergrad yeah you know, I think this is true of a lot of landscape architects you'll find that they they kind of grew up in forests or you know playing outside and and my childhood was no different. You know, I grew up building bike trails in the forest that was a block away from my house and, and not knowing what impact that was having on me. Um, when I got into undergrad, you know, and I was studying, you know, that kind of led me from art to economics to psychology and finally to geography and regional planning and everything started to started to click and and, you know, just, you know, wanting to understand those natural systems and, 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 you know, and the physical attributes of, of, of how those natural systems work was really interesting to me. And then while I was at undergrad at Salisbury State University, I, uh, you know, fell into a position working for the, um, working for the campus as the curator of plant records because the, the, the whole campus there is an arboretum, is a, an, a, an active arboretum. And so that, um, m- my boss at the time, uh, Les Lutz, who, who ran the arboretum, um, was a, a landscape ar- architect. And he got me interested in the professional landscape architecture mm-hmm. and not wanting to, you know, not wanting to either go into um, you know, weather mapping at NOAA or defense mapping for the Navy, which were basically, you know, kind of what the program was really, um, you know, pushing people towards, um, you know, I wanted to do more creative pursuits. And that, that took me to graduate school in California, um, and, you know, then eventually, um, you know, you know, having a degree in landscape architecture, you know, I, I, uh, you know, I just it's been it's been kind of designed first since since then, but with that background of you know the physical understanding of of natural systems. Pretty amazing how even if we don't know it as kids, the physical environment and what we're surrounded by and how we spend our time has such an unbelievable impact down the road. I mean, uh, some people know and some people don't. You know the name urban bonfire. It came from my experience growing up. Uh, we have a, my, my parents bought a, a small lake house, non-winterized when I was six years old and we went up and what started the whole idea of the bonfire and connecting people and outdoors, which who knew what that would be, you know, 40 years later, because that's literally what it is. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, the, the memories of what that created, the feeling, the, you know, even if you couldn't put your finger on it then, it really, those experiences just lay such an unbelievable track and foundation for what the future may hold. It, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's it, just a, it, yeah. And I'm always amazed that, you know, almost to a T, anytime you talk to somebody who, you know, is a designer, is an artist, is somebody who is working you know, you know, with the natural environment in any way, you know, they all point back to early childhood experiences being either immersed in nature or, you know, physically, you know, crafting or manipulating uh, nature. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of amazing how yeah. deep of a connection that, that, that it's created, you know. Yeah. I'm interested about something to ask you. You know, the term landscape architecture, I think, is one of the more misunderstood and confusing titles to the to the layperson or to the average consumer. You know, if you say what an architect does, 
I think the average person can paint a picture of that or, or a designer or, or an engineer, for example. Landscape architecture, people say, is that trees and plants? Is that pool? Is that hills and water drainage? Is that sunshade? Is that decks and kitchens and lounges? First of all, is that something that you, you see, you know? And, and second of all, or the more important part of the question is, have you seen a real shift or change in the role of landscape architecture over the last mm -hmm. 10 years or 15 or 20 years of your practice in what outdoor space means to people today versus what it m might have 15 or 20 years ago? Yeah, absolutely. All of that, you know, I think um, by, by nature and definition, we as landscape architects are generalists. And for better or for worse, that, that makes it really difficult to, um, to articulate what exactly we do, um, you know, in, in, in every situation. You know, I have family members who still don't understand <laughs> what I do. Like cl close family members, almost embarrassing to say, um, you know, how, how close family members don't quite understand the, the true nature of of the profession. Uh, and, and I do think it goes back to that idea that it's a very generalized profession where one side of the profession might be working specifically on civic spaces and another on residential spaces, or one person in the profession might be working um, in plant science where the other is working on, you know, materiality or, you know, for example, you know, outdoor, outdoor kitchens and, um, and, and or products and product design. So, so the, you know, the breadth of the profession and, and the ancillary professions that it touches is, is kind of staggering. The, the upshot. And I think the exciting part about being a profession professional in this day and age is that um, more and more people understand what, what it is you do as a landscape architect. And they have more of a frame of reference. Um, I don't know how that came about. I don't know if it's if it's just a greater awareness, um, or or if it's Pinterest. You know, being able to put more pictures in front of people that says, "Oh, you know, that's what landscape architecture is." Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't know, but it's, but but it is interesting, and it and it does seem to be evolving and changing in a in a more aware way. It, it's a good segue. I mean, you mentioned Pinterest and, and what I think, you know, and, and I ask this, quest, this question frequently to, you know, architects, designers, creatives in this space, that obviously today the consumer has far more access to um, projects of inspiration, whether that's through TV shows on HGTV, whether that is magazines, uh, House, Pinterest, and a whole host of other platforms. And if for no other reason, I think that that has allowed the average person to not have to necessarily have the vocabulary to be able to articulate, articulate what they like or what they don't, but be able to show it photographically and better communicate to their design professional what it is they, they are inspired by. And I have to imagine... In, in your world, there is both pro and con that comes with that. Uh, on the pro side, you know, you can have a much more meaningful conversation that better, um, better exposes the vision of, of the client. On the negative side, if they're sort of coming with a predetermined list of, I like this, I like this, I don't like this, I don't like this, is that becoming a little bit challenging for you to express your creativity in, in your role working with a client? Tell me about the, the last, it's really the last five or seven years that Pinterest and House mm -hmm. have really been sort of mainstream. Yeah. How has that affected your, your, your work, your role, communication with your clients? Love to hear about it. Yeah, I mean, it, it is, it is literally a, both a, a blessing and a, and a curse, um, as, as I think you were alluding to. Um, you know, now rather than trying to articulate ideas verbally, um, clients, um, you know, have the ability to um, kind of create a visual vocabulary 
uh, of what they like. And a lot of times those are very role, um, you know, impressions and, you know, don't necessarily tie together as a thread, you know, and so a lot of times, you know, there's, you know, they've kind of, Edu- the, you know, clients, speaking of clients, they've educated themselves up to a point by, you know, understanding this visual vocabulary, but, but it still requires more education to, to get them to understand what the, you know, what the truer implications of, uh, of, you know, putting those two ideas together are, or getting from, you know, what is a very, you know, cursory, idea on the surface and and trying to you know build on it and make it a more meaningful and and deeper idea that um you know that i find often surprises them and you know and they they kind of you know surprise themselves like oh like you know you know i really you know i really feel deep deeply about that and and i thought it was more aesthetics but it's really something that's more you know it's like a, a deeper a deeper feeling. And as a result of that, and, and with obviously over the last, again, over the last 10 years, plus or minus, there's been a major upswing in the excitement investment design of outdoor spaces. Um, you know, it's really very much on, on, a, on an upswing in terms of what people are looking for, and they're paying a lot more attention to it earlier on in the design process, whether it's a renovation or or new construction. And I also note, and I'd love your thought on this, I mean, you're part of the the KAA design group, you know, incredibly well-renowned design firm, huge number of of projects, just, you know, a a really, really extremely well-respected, well-regarded design firm. And What's interesting is I think historically landscape architecture firms were independent of design firms. And now we're seeing this kind of thing where, you know, they need or a a prominent design firm looking to deliver the type of project continuity, design aesthetic quality to their, their clients. It's not almost a, a, it's almost a need at this point because the outdoors plays so much into the overall vision for, for a home or for a space. Are you seeing this as a trend that's now becoming where it's becoming a more aligned set of practices under one roof? Because the idea of specialty firms in silos seems to be diminishing and full service firms that offer design, architecture, landscape, all of those things as a one-stop shop without, is becoming more prevalent. And I'd love to hear, you know, your experience in joining the KA design group and what you're seeing as, as a result. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, hearing you ask that question, I'm just, I'm kind of thinking like, you know, I, I really, I was really, kind of, you know, like, like born for the role that I'm in. Um, I, and, you know, the architects that I work with, you know, jokingly like to say that, you know, that I, sh- that typical landscape architects stay five feet away from the edge of the building. But I took that to mean not the five feet on the outside of the building, but five feet on the interior of the building. You know, um, I've always been comfortable, you know, just as comfortable giving, um, giving ideas about what the architecture should do to craft around the, the landscape as, you know, ideas that the landscape should, to, should, should consider to craft around the architecture. And, and I think uh, ultimately that is, um, from, from my perspective, is one of the greatest strengths from of KA design is that, is that we have that relationship and that we push those boundaries um, mm-hmm. on a, you know, on every project. Um, I, I, I do think that there are other firms, um, you know, it's not a, it's not a big secret that there's a lot of strength in that from a, you know, from a, you know, design, from a design standpoint. Um, and that idea, you know, I don't know if it's, if it's spreading or if it's cyclical and, you know, you know, it, or it goes back and forth. Um, but I, I, I do know that uh, 
a lot of the stronger design that I see, um, you know, when you look at it as a holistic package between architecture and landscape and, and even interiors in that mix as well, are, are coming out of, of firms that are, you know, either fully integrated or, or have partnerships where, you know, they might share an office space. It might be, you know, they might be distinct firms, but they share an office space and, sure. and, you know, it's no longer a relationship of, okay, I'm going to do this work and then, and then I'm going to hand it off to you. And then you can noodle with it for a couple of weeks and then come back. And, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, through the gift of technology and proximity that those conversations are, are happening simultaneously rather than, uh, you know, rather than reacting, you know, re-react. And, and for someone who's been doing this really as, as, as this core profession for really for, for a long time, are you able to track and see patterns changing of request, expectation, um, demands of consumers today as it relates to outdoors? Like, has, has, have people, what they're asking for, what they want, what they expect from their outdoor space, can you sort of map a fundamental shift or change between, let's say, 10 years ago and today on just what is being asked for and, and, and how they are, I don't know if the right word, if the right term is respecting the outdoors in the same way, because I think everybody always does. But maybe it's a question of yeah. thinking about it with the same level of thought and investment in terms of activation and, and making that space, not a space, but a room. Can you talk a little bit about the consumer yeah. psychology around it through the, through yeah. the course of your, your experience? Yeah, you know, every time we start a project, we go through a visioning process, whether we are doing that with the, our clients or we're doing it in-house, you know, and trying to, you know, trying to take what information we, we have from the, the, the client and trying to, trying to build a, a vision for, uh, for the, a project. That um, often involves um, coming up with, you know, kind of key themes that, that, a, that a project wants to, um, you know, kind of uh, craft itself around. Um, it's, uh, you know, 10 years ago, you know, the, the big keyword there was indoor outdoor, mm -hmm. right? And, and that kind of speaks to like this kind of understanding that, that oh, the outdoors is as, as, as important as the interior. Um, and it's almost to the point now where it's cliche, where it is, you know, it is, it is on every single project, one of the tenants that we approach the design with. So what we're trying to do now is actually dig deeper into that and actually, you know, understand what the nuances of that relationship between in, indoor and outdoor are. And, and the, you know, like I was saying earlier, the deeper meaning behind it um, and really kind of digging in with clients to both educate them, but also to, you know, kind of better understand how they live. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because I do think that that as it has become a more commonplace idea, this idea of indoor outdoor design, um, clients have, you know, they, they pay more attention to it. You know, they see more images that reinforce that, that imagery. And then, you know, and then they, you know, they have a, a, a deeper understanding and, you know, it, it's not, you're no longer starting from A and having to get to, you know, to get to the C, mm -hmm. you know, w you know, with them understanding that concept, you know, we're already at C and now we can get to, you know, J, K and, and L. Um, with 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 their with their understanding and do you think part of that is that there are a lot more products and materials on the market today yeah. that are you know aligned with a more discerning design aesthetic whether that is furniture uh, uh decking surfaces uh lighting heaters outdoor tv uh, cabinets uh, countertop materials 
are you seeing that there is a correlation between interest and enthusiasm in outdoor space design and activation that is commensurate with the design professional consumer feeling like they have a much more elaborate set of options to pick from than they might have 10 years ago, or is more like granite, stone, a gas propane heater, and really that's kind of Bob's your uncle at that point versus now where it's like, you want an outdoor dishwasher? Sure. Outdoor TV? Be my guest. You want to like, it's almost limitless at, at, at this point. Do you see that as a, as a contributing factor to the overall excitement and growth in, in the category? Yeah, it, absolutely. And, and this kind of goes back to technology. The, you know, like as, as, you know, take for example, iPhones, you know, got more and more refined. I mean, you know, people really started to fetishize the aesthetics of it. And I yes. think that, uh, you know, say what you will about, say what you will about all that, you know, it's kind of created this dynamic in the world where, people understand things from a material and a materiality sense yes. and, and much more tuned into, um, you know, what that means to them. Um, you know, you, 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 you not only have the, you know, the visual aspects of it, you have the tactile experience and you have the cultural overlay of, of like, Hey, look at my shiny new this or my, you know, my shiny new that, or, you know, look, uh, you know, it, it, it's also, you know, this isn't the first time this has happened. You know, if you look back at, um, you know, historic gardens and, and, you know, France and, and, and Italy, you know, there were you know, the same thing played out with, with garden design where, yeah. you know, people were, you know, in a arms race, if you will, to, to have the, the best, the most expensive, the most elaborate garden. And, and now the difference is, is that's not only available to, you know, kings and queens and, and clergy, that's available to, to, you know, a wider, a wider audience, right? And so, um, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing holding back people from, from having that beauty in their lives and the markets have responded by by producing a lot more you know materials and products that service that and and i think you're one of the points you just made very subtly goes back to what you talked about earlier on with you know childhood experiences and that you know i think when we were kids we were outside and we were almost forced to create our own worlds and you went built you think you said bike paths and things like that and i was building forts and 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 you know those types of those types of things and it being in an outdoor environment where really your only factor is time and nature you're put into an environment and, and i say force it has negative connotation but almost the opposite it's the positive you, you create the activity in the world based on who you're with if you're with friends if you're alone the weather and all these types of things and I still believe that today, one of the reasons why I think the outdoors is so special and why it's special to me is that it, it, it almost creates a more fun and creative environment than being indoors because it resembles that childhood experience where mm -hmm. people might you know, spend $200,000 on, on an indoor kitchen and spend $25,000 on their outdoor deck and enjoy it much, much more because it has a more authentic and real feel and doesn't feel so confined and, and, and that type of thing. And I think that's one of the beauties of the outdoors, regardless of somebody's wealth, uh, you know, design aesthetic, there's something very simple and beautiful about just being outdoors. And I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, I say all the time when I'm, when I'm, when I'm doing trainings with some of our dealers and things like that, one of the original reasons I started Urban Bonfire was it had it was it was a style of food and and people coming together that didn't have the same level of socioeconomic boundaries put on it as indoor. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, whether you drive a bus or you own a hedge fund, a good burger around the outdoors with friends is a great experience. Yeah. And 
I always thought that was important to me and I could never really articulate it until recently, but that's yeah. in its essence what, what, it's, what it was for me. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I think the, you know, the, the, what I feel the difference is, is that when you're in nature, it's way more dynamic than an interior experience, right? You've got, you've got the sun and the way that shifts and plays on different surfaces. You've got, you know, there's always the movement of wind. Um, there, you know, there's always the way, um, you know, um, you know, going back to the way the light catches on, on, you know, plants, there's, there's, there's that connect, that connection to nature. There's, there's kind of understanding these diurnal and ephemeral changes that, are constantly happening. And when you're in an outdoor space, you are part of that. When you're in an interior space, you're, you're separated from that. And, yes. you know, being part of that, I think, makes you more humane. And I think that translates into, um, you know, relationships and interactions you're having with other, with other individuals. Well, in those I agree, it, and and it not it also enforced by just the impact of the seasons, and it shows, you know, you know, it it represents a real life cycle. I mean, maybe less so in in California, for example, than in Montreal. But you know, if I look out from my kitchen onto my back into my back space, depending on you know if I were to put a camera and track three hundred and sixty five days. I would get, you know, everything is cold and covered in snow and desolate to it blooms and it buds and, and out come the leaves to the leaves fall and change colors to it really is representative of life cycle. And that's really interesting, unlike the indoors, which is can be very static in the way it is, it, it is felt in the way that it's used. Yeah. And that's not always bad. I'm not, I'm not, yeah, of course. you know, sure. you know, I mean that, that kind of stability is, is good in some ways, you know, that of kind course. of prospect refuge, um, you know, dialogue that I'm sure everybody is familiar with. Um, you know, <laughs> but I, I think the being outdoors and experiencing life, um, and just the, the beauty of life, the subtle beauty of life, that you can find in, in almost all things. Um, yeah. You know, if you really look for it and tune into it, you're much, you're, you have a much higher likelihood of finding that um, in an outdoor setting than in an indoor setting. Absolutely, because there are elements that no matter what, we can't control. And I think part of that is the creativity and the fun of how we're going to react to things that we, we can't control, whether subtly or, or in a more major way. Yeah. At this point, you know, it's a, it's a great, uh, it leads really well in, in, into sort of the next thing I wanted to ask you about, which is, you know, you've been doing this for a long time and you've obviously seen tremendous progress and change in, in project. And, you know, at this point with all that you've done being a part of the, the, the KA design group, what, what, what lights you up? what jazzes you when something lands on your desk? What like sort of really says like, this is just, I, I, I'm, this reminds me of why I did this and why I do this and why I love what I do. Cause you said you couldn't have crafted a better, a better role and a better profession than you have. And that's a beautiful thing to hear for anyone to say, regardless of what they do, but yeah. at the risk of, you know, is there sometimes redundancy in, you know, similar things and what, what lights you up? What jazzes you in, in, in when you get a new project or something? Um, yeah, you know, I have to be careful how I answer this question because I want to make sure to not offend, not offend architects or landscape of architects on, on either side of that question. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm just kidding there. Um, the the thing that 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 really lights me up. Um, and you know it's it's you know it's become tougher because we're not in the office together. Mm -hmm. But um, it's it's really kind of being at the table with other designers, with clients, um, talking about ideas, right, and then articulating those ideas in three dimensional form. You know that will eventually get built, 
that that whole process to me is um is you know it's just you know it's just amazing it makes me feel electric almost mm -hmm. is 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 like just is you know understanding and experiencing and being a part of that arc as idea comes to reality um you know and yeah yeah it's it's great for me but it's also very rewarding to see you know a client start to you know start start to come from an idea in their head and to us giving a physical form on a drawing mm -hmm. and then you know, and then in the construction process, them saying, oh, <laughs> I can see it now, you know, and then that excitement builds as you get closer and closer to the finish line. Um, and, you know, and, you know, as a designer, you get to, you get to, at times, go on that ride with them. Um, but other times you get to, um, you know, you get to guide that path. Um, and, and you get to, you know, explore some really fascinating ideas, um, you know, not just aesthetic ideas, um, you know, you know, spiritual, um, you know, these ideas of, of how people live and what their lifestyles are. Um, and like, you know, like you've been talking about how it's shifting, you know, how it's reacting to the larger world. Um, all that stuff is, is, is fascinating to me, you know, that kind of sits below the surface um, and, and tempers, you know, tempers decisions um, and ideas. It's fascinating to me. Yeah, I, I, I feel very much the same way. I mean, just when, when we have clients, whether it's through, you know, designer, architect, members of our trade ambassador program, regardless of, of what it is, where the discussion on outdoors is happening at the same time as indoors and the client is seeing that as not part of that historic, I'll finish the indoors and the outdoors mm -hmm. is not an afterthought, but it's part, it's 2.0. I'm not necessarily thinking about how they interact. I'm not thinking about the visual functional connectivity of the two spaces. The more yeah. those lines that have been historically been blurred become clearer and the more we see it as, as really one space, just slightly divided by a wall or a, or, or a door or glass or that type of thing, that is what really drives me. That's what sort of lights me up is really seeing that the place for, you know, outdoor memories and indoor memories are seen at that same level mm -hmm. of, of, of importance. Um, and I really think that is happening at an unbelievably rapid rate today. And I think, you know, I, I don't like the term silver lining, but if lacking a better term, <laughs> the silver lining yeah. of yeah. what COVID has done is, I think it is, it has yeah. forced many people to look at their outdoors and say, here is a, here is a space that we can get a lot more, fun memory from enjoyment in whatever that may be. And we're going to think about this very differently than we might have before because yeah. we have now the time and, and the ability to do that. So I think we're just at the, still at the infancy level of mm -hmm. outdoor space activation. And, and, and I think it's a great, great place to be. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted yeah. to be where we it'll, are. It'll be interesting to see, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully a, um, a vaccine is close and things might return to normal. It'll be interesting to see if, um, if people transition back to the way or how, to what extent people transition back to the way they used to live and interact with their, their homes and their personal outdoor spaces. Um, yeah. I, I know at the beginning of this pandemic, people were, um, you know, it's like they were discovering their, you know, rediscovering their their houses and their outdoor spaces um, all over again. And um, I don't know the numbers, but but um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure there was like a major uptick in in home improvement projects because people were like, oh, you know, I don't have to spend all of my time indoors. Mm -hmm. You know, 
and, and drive myself crazy. I can, you know, I can divide my time between this space outdoors and that space outdoors and, and this room indoors and, and, and really, you know, kind of, you know, you know, crafted that, you know, what used to be going to different buildings or, you know, different parts of the city and now kind of, and now trying to, you know, recreate that, but on your own, in your own space, your own home, like re recreating those different, those different views, those different feelings, those different, you know, those, those different, um, um, you know, surroundings you know, yeah. in order to break up the monotony, you know, yep. probably to some degree, but it'll be interesting to see how much that is, that has, you know, kind of cemented in people's minds, like, oh, this is actually pleasant. Like, I, I, I don't know why I didn't do this more often before, I, you know, before COVID. And <laughs> it'll be interesting to see. I, I, I think that I think that it is a, to call it a trend would be, I think, doing it a disservice or almost disrespect. I think that it is a, I think that it is going to be a very, very important um structural and foundational element in people's lives for a very, very long time, if not forever. Um, and, and I think that that's a really important thing. You know, I've been doing this for a few years. You've been doing this for almost your entire, basically your entire career. So I have to imagine that the, the culmination of seeing, you know, things that you really were at, at the, at the ground level as a pioneer in many, many years ago, now seeing it becoming really mainstream and so important, I, I have to imagine that feels very good in terms of your, your, your contribution to so many projects and so many people's lives. Well, yeah, I mean, it's not very just cool. me. Of course, there's always... <laughs> of course, know, there's, there's, the, there's, there's the slow each, march each of... Uh, yeah, but yeah. each person, you know, when, as you said earlier, the part that you love when you sit at that table during that envisioning process, that, that's a lot yeah. of, you know, it, it's a big part of it, you know, yeah. so like everything else. Michael, yeah, I've, for uh, sure. I've really, yeah. for sure, I've really enjoyed the time. I, I want to thank you for, uh, thank you for your time. And uh, this has been great. I uh, look forward to uh, future collaborations with you and uh, talking yeah. to you again and, uh, May I wish you and your family and your colleagues of, uh, you know, uh, ongoing health and safety. And uh, hopefully this vaccine is, uh, is here very, very soon. And uh, hopefully next time I'm allowed to travel and can make it to uh, Los Angeles, it'd be great to uh, meet you in person. And I, I really look forward to that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you um, for the opportunity. Um, but also just, you know, it's just great to, to talk with with people um, about ideas, um, I, I you know can't under underscore the importance of that um, <laughs> you know any any more um, and, and appreciate the sentiment um, um, as well for for everybody that I'm involved with. Greatly appreciate it, Michael. Be well. Talk yeah. to you soon. Thanks so much. Thanks for joining us for today's episode of the Fireside Chat with landscape architect Michael McGowan, a member of the KAA Design Group in Los Angeles, California. I really enjoyed speaking with him and learning a lot about his passions, what he is seeing in client needs, wants, and expectations, and how more and more together as a member of the seat at the table during the envisioning process, the indoor and outdoor are coming together as a unified part of people's indoor and outdoor lives. Please join us for future episodes by subscribing to our podcast. Please follow us on YouTube and, of course, on LinkedIn and Instagram at Urban Bonfire. Until next time, thanks so much for listening.